Good morning. Um, could you close your eyes? Okay. Um, this time it's to uh, imagine a very, very long way away in deep, deep space, a very, very long time ago. Um, two black holes, uh, they fall into each other's gravitational pull and they start to orbit each other and they get closer and closer and faster and faster. And eventually, inevitably, they collide. And so what kind of sound does that make? You know, is it a bang? No, it turns out it's something more like this. <laughs> now, um, you may have heard last year about um, gravitational waves and the team that discovered them when they won the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics. Um, it's tremendously complicated, but to give it a very, very brief overview, um, they built a series of L-shaped tunnels um, deep underground, sort of two kilometers in each direction. And they sent a split laser down these tunnels um, at mirrors at the end, and then compared the reflections as they came back. And in this way, they were able to hear ripples in reality caused by objects of unimaginable vastness and mass and speed swooshing around each other in deep, deep space billions of years ago and smashing into each other. Now, this all sounds rather sort of Doctor Who kind of thing, but it's completely real. And it's one of these events that gave birth to the supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy, which is called Sagittarius A star. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a musician and a composer um, who loves science. And I feel very fortunate that I feel that kind of, in some ways, it sort of belongs to me, because not everyone, I think, feels that. And with something frontier science, but, um, when you're trying to describe it to people and you start using words like algorithm or space-time curvature, um, people's eyes kind of go blank and uh, they'll start looking at their phones. Um, not, not, not here, not you, obviously, but uh, this is a self-selecting group, I think. But even having said that, we can't all be cosmologists. Um, so. Who here likes music? Yes, good. I like music as well. It's, um, <laughs> it's good for my job. Um, <laughs> uh, music connects us, uh, connects us to each other and to ourselves, to our own emotions. And it reaches out beyond, beyond uh, our individual experience. But also, it can tell stories beyond words. And, what I'm going to talk about today is using music as a bridge between ideas and science and the hearts of an audience. With uh, gravitational waves, you have an opportunity to take what is some really beautiful, really exciting frontier breaking uh, exploration, and you can make it viscerally engaging to a non specialist audience using music as that bridge. Now, to tell this uh, story, um, I should tell you a little bit about my friend Samaya, Samaya Nasanki. Um, we went to school together, um, and then we went to the same university, where I studied archaeology and anthropology, um, and she studied astrophysics. And I really loved her subject, but the maths was, shall we say, tricky. <laughs> And so I got this kind of vicarious experience of astrophysics in that world through Samaya. Um, and she got on board with the gravitational wave, waves project very early on, so in the early 2000s. And I kind of picked up bits and bobs here and there. But it was, at that point, yeah, many people thought an impossible dream, a moonshot, if you will. Um, so over the years, I got a few glimpses. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I got more of a picture. When I went to visit Sammy in, um, in LA, where she was teaching and doing research at Caltech. 
Um, now, I remember the morning that we first sat down. It was in a garden, a very sunny garden, just off Franklin Avenue in uh, the Hollywood Hills, overlooked by the Hollywood Hills. So you've got the Hollywood sign sort of overlooking us. And uh, Samaya had said that these gravitational waveforms were, were awesome and there's perhaps some musical you know, ground to be made. So I brought my laptop and my headphones and uh, she gave me the USB stick. I plugged them in and I started to listen. And the first time I heard it, much as you did, I couldn't help laughing. Because I think it's because something that's so friendly sounding uh, can represent something that is so violent and uh, something that stretches, stretches the imagination almost to breaking point. Um, the imagination, but also the metaphor, <laughs> uh, in the sense that these aren't sounds uh, traveling through space. Uh, because there's no air, so that would be, that would be silly. Um, these are uh, ripples in the fabric of the space-time curvature. So they're expansions and contractions in space. Uh, so our ears are expanding and contracting along with the space that the ripples are moving through. Um, these, uh, what we have at this point is gravitational waves expressed as sound waves. But the point is really worth making, that that's all that's been done to these gravitational waves. That they haven't been sort of sped up or slowed down or filtered or you know, inverted or any of the things one would normally, normally do. Gravitational waves generate over very human time frames, so minutes rather than you know, millennia or aeons or nanoseconds. Um, and so you have this uh, rather beautiful idea that you can take a bit of Nobel Prize winning science and bring it to a wider audience. And so when I started to think about the music, um, this was my experience. It was this uh, kind of this narrative, kind of emotional story of deep space exploration, um, people spending huge amounts of their lives doing something for all of us. And uh, it's a, sen yeah, a sense of adventure. And so this really feeds into a musical project in the sense of you know, the emotional uh, immediacy. And so as I started with it, this was all front and center. And um, it struck me that this is a great way to get into the science for someone without a physics background. And uh, yeah, so music is something that we all have innately. And in this instance, you can use music to help people get into the cockpit and feel the ride for themselves. And so the sun, our sun, eventually will uh, collapse in on itself and become a neutron star, um, an object of incredible density, but it'll only be about maybe the size of LA. And it will wander off into space on its own lonely journey, who knows where. And in, in due course, it may well meet another super dense object, so another neutron star or a black hole or a... A uh, supermassive black hole. And to my mind, they're rather romantic and heroic, these neutron stars, because that's kind of where it all begins. They're the smallest in the story. And it's romantic and heroic because they fall into a dance, a dance with another object. And faster and faster, inevitably, they collide. And that's the death of a star, but the birth of a black hole. The um, other thing about these events, which is good fun, is um, they spew out lots of energy and matter. And if any of you are wearing gold right now, sort of like this ring, um, this comes from one of these events, uh, a kilonova or a supernova. Um, it's basically anything further up the periodic table than carbon, so anything above 12, which is kind of fun, we're wearing stars. Um, so anyway, Einstein predicted 100 years ago, just over, but, um, that these events would send out ripples in the fabric of space-time. And as these uh, orbits get shorter and shorter and faster and faster, the distance between the peaks and troughs will get shorter. And so you'll get a, uh, a sort of ski jump shape, a sort of exponential 
hook up. And uh, when you express it as a sound like that, uh, that's sort of why they get called chirps. Um, we're going to get to the music in just a second. <laughs> well, one last thing uh, to mention is that um, this science was done in a very unusual way, and it was absolutely enormous, and it involved so many people and so much time and money and conviction and bravery, uh, I think, uh, in the sense that it started with a theory 100 years ago, and then lots of ideas in the meantime about how it might be done. But then in the 70s and 80s, a plan was hatched, and it pulled, you know, came through, and then people like my friend Samaya, but thousands, literally thousands of people, worked together on a theory to look for the evidential you know, proof. And normally, that's not how it works. Normally, it's very much the other way around. So this is bottom-up, bottom-up science, literally a moonshot. Um, and it was done for all of us, and so I always find that rather, rather moving. Um, so the, uh, to get to the music bits now, um, what you can do if you want to start turning these things into music, um, do one of several things. Uh, first of all, you can chop up the actual sound waves. So you sort of take uh, low bits and high bits, uh, for instance, and you alternate them. So that sounds something like this. And then you can take sort of lower bits and like that. And you can start making uh, drum sounds by sort of playing over the top of that. And there's also a quality to a lot of the waveforms, which is that you can stretch them out and you can create sort of fabric, which, sonic fabric, which I've never sort of come across before, which is uh, really cool. And then again, you just sort of start layering these things up. Um, and it starts to sound a bit like a dance record, um, but made out of these kind of kind of cool things, yeah, just not things you wouldn't have thought up on your own. And uh, another thing you can do is to take uh, the shape of the waveform, you know, the graph, um, and uh, put that onto an actual stave, so you know, notes that you can play on an instrument. Um, and so to do that, uh, you end up with things like this. So this is with the piano just playing the notes, sort of mapped. There you go. And um, <laughs> so at that point, you have these elements um, which come sort of from space in the sense of, uh, you know, not from here. And um, you have uh, a job, I have a job as a composer, to draw a link between that and the, yeah, the audience, and to make it sound good, to make it engage with someone's heart. And so, and to do that, in this case, I wrote string parts, um, which we then went to uh, Prague and got the uh, City of Prague Philharmonic to record these parts. And the idea is that they work as a glue to kind of pull everything together and create a musical narrative that makes sense to, well, to anyone and everyone, we would hope. And uh, yeah, the, that contrast of the most human sound, which is an orchestra, well, most human kind of comfortable, familiar musical sound of an orchestra, combined with deep space, sort of sets off, well, I think, yeah, it, it's been very, very interesting to work with that. Um, so I'm going to play you the, a few minutes in just a second. So uh, to wind up, um, Music can be a very good way to bring science to, uh, to an audience that wouldn't otherwise feel any ownership in that sense. And I think at the moment you've got things like, like Musk sending his car into space um, with Don't Panic written on the dashboard, which, as I'm sure you know, comes from uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And again, I think it's the same thing. You take something which is very familiar and you combine it with space science, and you kind of really you know, get people and you pull them out into space. Um, and also, at the moment, we're all, yeah, well, the world is celebrating 
Stephen Hawking and all his work, which is central to the gravitational wave um, work. And so I think it's a very worthy enterprise to take, to take music and use it as a way to introduce people to ideas that they may never explore further. But if they just know that there's some sort of space here in the music, and that's interesting, then that's enough. Uh, and if they want to go and learn more about Virgo and LIGO and the amazing people behind them, then so much the better. Um, I'm going to leave you with the music now, and I hope you like it. Thank you very much.